This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. This week, we are talking about hunting culture and how it changes over the years, how it's different between regions, and what exactly creates hunting cultures. But before that, we have just a few headlines from the week. In Colorado, a bill is making its way through the legislature that would place an additional tax on firearms and ammunition pending voter approval in November. The bill was introduced as an 11% tax on all retail sale of firearms and ammunition, but an amendment has been made to reduce it down to 9%. The revenue would go towards crime victim support service, gun violence prevention, safe and lawful gun use, and enhancement of school safety. The Congressional Sportsman Foundation put out an article on the matter voicing concerns how legislation such as this is often eventually used as a vector of attack for other issues pertaining to sportsmen. Some proponents that testified in favor of the bill stated that they hoped that it will reduce the number of gun owners and hunters in the state, while other proponents also stated that they hope it will be a stable funding source. Opponents of the bill that testified included the Congressional Sportsman Foundation, Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project, Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, and the National Rifle Association. Arguments against talked about the potential loss of Pittman-Robertson conservation dollars due to decreased gun sales along with negative impact to hunters by increasing the barrier to entry. The bill has moved to the Colorado House Appropriation Committee where it is expected to pass. However, Congressional Sportsman Foundation did note that it will have a much tougher time passing through the Senate as they have not been eager to raise any sort of taxes this year. We'll have to keep following this and see how it progresses. Also in Colorado, the hunting community along with the U.S. Forest Service is pushing back on a hunting ban that has been implemented by Boulder County. The land in question largely consists of Forest Service land where the county placed a ban on all recreational shooting and hunting, including archery. The closure is a result of a state statute that allows for closure of areas that exceed 100 residents per square mile. While there have been significant complaints about recreational shooting, one of the county commissioners did state that there was a lack of testimony of hunting causing the problem. Regardless, they still ended up closing it down to both shooting and hunting. The Forest Service is not contesting the recreational shooting aspect of the ban, but they are arguing that the county does not have the authority to restrict hunting on those lands. Boulder County Board of Commissioners will meet on April 23rd to discuss the next steps. Update in Nebraska, a bill that would have transferred money out of the state game fund and habitat fund to the general fund has been amended to exclude those portions concerning conservation dollars. The bill had been a part of Governor Steve Erdman's plan for property tax cuts, which included diverting money from multiple state funds to pay for it. But after backlash from many sportsman groups and concerned citizens, they successfully saved the Nebraska Game and Parks budget. I'd call that a win for hunters for sure. The U.S. Geological Survey just released the fourth volume of ungulate migrations of the United States, which documents 33 new mule deer, pronghorn, and elk migrations, which brings the total up to 182 unique herds of migration routes across 10 states. Matt Kaufman, the lead author of the report, stated that he's impressed how the team has worked together to adopt a standard set of methods to create robust migration maps of these ungulates across the West. These maps will be invaluable for the conservation of multiple species and understanding what areas require the most protection and how future development occurs. Also, it's just incredibly interesting to see what these animals go through, the routes they take and the different strategies that they have to survive. Super cool stuff, and it's significant that this report is available for free. You can go online and access the entire document, which is pretty awesome. That's all we have for headlines this week, but now we're jumping into the deeper dive where we're talking about hunting culture, what creates it, and how it's going to look in the future. I have my own set of hunting cultures that I got from my parents, from, you know, those were my mentors, my hunting mentors. And like, so what I viewed as normal or like what our cultural norms were, what was right, what was wrong, what was ethical versus unethical was largely instilled from my parents and then and and I guess we should back up and talk about we're talking about with like within the bounds of legality so I think most (laughs) most people most people I think agree that like whatever laws the state has in place like okay those are within the bounds of legality like there are still like things that we view as good bad right wrong ethical unethical and so there's some weird ones, and I'm curious what people think on things that they've they've witnessed and how they, how, like, where did your hunting culture come from, and like, how does it, how does it change over the years? I think it changes with age, it changes with region. There's just a lot of things that drive it. Absolutely. I mean, you guys gave me the hard ride last year when we were out turkey hunting. I said I'm gonna go shoot two jakes out of a roosting tree, and you guys, it's about lit, lit me on fire. <laughs> 
<laughs> what the hell's wrong with that? Well, I think I'm probably more on the long, along the lines of your thought process on turkeys. But yeah, I saw, I saw, it, it, I've, yeah. Well, I've learned a lot about tur- like turkey hunting, especially has some like really interesting roots and in, like what's uh, acceptable and unacceptable. Yeah, that even if it is legal. That's but, why I don't turkey hunt. Yeah, well, I, Bla- Blake turkey hunts a lot, so he's like right he's our resident expert on. Did, like, did you see the look he gave last year when I said <laughs> I'm going to shoot those jakes out of a roosting tree? There ain't nothing to this turkey hunting stuff. Yeah, well, I think shooting jakes is fine. That's not not an issue. But I find that the roost tree is kind of like their safe space. You know, okay. it's like the one spot that it's they go up there to avoid predation okay. and. They are just so easily preyed upon, and it's like that's the one time that it's like. So when you just ducks don't come into them. your decoys because they're looking for a safe space, you <laughs> shoo them away because you don't <laughs> want to shoot one of them. Well, I guess if you're talking about a roosting spot for ducks, if yeah. you hunt the roost where the ducks are feeling safe, okay, they just go south. Okay, right. So if you watch the birds at night and you're like, all right, they're landing in this spot. Uh-huh. I'm going to hunt them somewhere else or a different time, not before they go to bed. Because if you don't put them to bed, they're not going to be there the next time you go. Huh. Not, not, maybe not the same for turkeys because they, they don't often roost in the same tree. But it is kind of like the the one spot where it's like, hey, if they're in the tree already, we'll get them tomorrow. So, Randy, okay. let's say say you're hunting elk, right? Yeah. And you're you're driving down the road and then there's right. this – this bull that this whatever you know bull elk that you'd be yeah. plenty happy with shooting in any mm-hmm. circumstance right like oh that's a really nice bull it's on public land yeah and it runs up and there's a like a big tall woven wire fence and he just can't get through that fence and he's just yeah. bouncing back and forth and he just can't go anywhere yeah would you go shoot him i don't know <laughs> I would. It's, le- it's, it's I, legal. I, I probably would. Okay. I was just curious. I'm trying to think of an analogy to like uh, yeah. make it make sense to like, if it's just like, man, it's almost like it doesn't have a chance. But you're, yeah. you're talking you know? to a guy who shoots grouse on a stump, shoots them <laughs> on trees. You know, I shoot quail on the ground when they're running. I've shot ducks on the water. I've done all of the above uh, as it's well. Like, so you're not, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and here's the part that cracks me up is like, Sometimes when we've done these things and people see me thump a grouse out of a tree or something, and there's just some purists who say that's unethical. Well, let's not confuse ethics with personal preference, right? Well, I think there are things, though, like at the risk of bringing up what we talked about in last week's episode about the guy running down a wolf with a snowmobile. Right. That's, I think it, that's it, it appears unethical. that most people view that as that's, not not real great. Right. That's I, I would <laughs> so, say that's unethical to do to any animal. Okay. But, but it was legal. I, I mean, like, there's parts of it that were borderline of that particular right. incident. But, but the, I the fact earlier, that you uh, can run them down with a vehicle is, like, right. that is legal. Right. But I thought earlier you just didn't want you wanted to make sure that there's differences between the boundaries of ethics and legality or or well, that's a, that, expected behavior and legality yeah that's kind of what i'm getting at is like just okay. what i think people do draw a line somewhat right i think mm-hmm. like the collective mass like does have stuff that they largely are like ooh, yeah that's that's not very ethical right but then everything outside of that gray area is where it gets a lot more confusing like right like shooting a bird on the ground. I think that one is like, depending on where you grew up, who you hunted with, that one's like a, a drastically different yeah. depending on. And if you with. go back to the history of where a lot of this came from, it came from the 1800s when the, if you want to call them the New York elitists, the Roosevelt's and the, the other very wealthy people would criticize the pot hunters. Right? The guys who were out hunting for meat and didn't have the sporting code. Right. That's where a lot of this really came from. Yeah. And to back to the point of roosting uh, turkeys, isn't it even illegal in some states? It is. To it, shoot it is a illegal. Turkey out of a tree. I yeah. was very surprised to hear that it was legal here. Yeah. I had never heard of that before. I always thought it was uh, against the law. So, yeah, it definitely is illegal in a lot of states. Yeah. So, yeah. Or I don't know about a lot, but there's a, there's, it is illegal in certain uh, Another thing with that is this is in Montana, you can hunt 30 minutes past sunset. 
where a lot right. of states that I've hunted for turkeys, it's it's at sunset. So that de facto would make him you wouldn't be shooting yeah, him out of the roost. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Although there's been mornings when I've been out that I've um, seen turkeys roosted. I think into sunrise, like where the sun comes up in the air. Oh, absolutely. Especially later in the year, they'll yeah. stay up in the tree longer. So there's. No, I I re- try to respect whatever culture regional local whatever you want to call it cultural traditions are there and these are very regional yeah. and very and I think, specific to and over the te- over time too i yeah. think that's the other interesting i think there's probably things i think there's things that were done 50 years ago that we think are absolutely unacceptable and there's been laws put around a lot of them too right. but then there's i bet there are things that we do today that 50 years from now we'll probably look at similarly Oh, absolutely. They're like, wow, I can't sure believe not. we used to do whatever. Like, I don't know what it'll be. I just, yeah. I I mean, some states you still can't hunt on Sundays. Yeah. Yeah. Why? I mean, Religious I, beliefs, I think, largely. Well, I think it all, it, yeah. yeah, like you mentioned, I mean, just stems from year, like hundreds of years ago, like yep. traditions that just don't get changed or something like that. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. So I... I I, I like investigating all these things. I think they're really fun to think about and try to think about where they come from. Like in Minnesota, party hunting for deer is a big thing. Yeah. When I came out west and you couldn't party hunt, I'm like, well, what do you mean you can't party hunt? I grew up in a state where that's what you did. Everybody, you know, you went out and hunting a group of six, eight people, and if Deer came running by. You just laid them down until you were out of bullets or out of deer. Yeah, and to, and to and, me, and that, that was, like, not okay. I don't right. Like, I just grew up like, no, 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 no. That is not something that is okay. Like, God. you can't just use someone else's tag. Like, that's not. Right. And, and so I, I, don't, don't, I don't do that anymore. But it, it, when I was 14, if four deer would have came by and there were five of us in the party and I didn't shoot until either those deer were gone and – or on the ground, or I was out of bullets, my dad would have put a boot in my butt. It, this is how it was. Yeah. So, and I have no idea where that came from. Yeah. Well, because, so Because it's the, one of the few states, I think Iowa, you might be able to party hunt too, but I don't know that for sure. So I shouldn't, shouldn't hang that albatross around the neck <laughs> of, of Iowans. So. Is that something like if you were to go back to a place that allows party hunting and you were in a group of a couple people, would you jump right back into party hunting, or is no. it something now that you look at and you go, "I actually don't want to," you don't, I don't, you don't. So even do though it's le- so even though it's legal in that situation, you right. wouldn't you wouldn't want to do it. I wouldn't do it. No, okay, I just so. yeah, I've come to the way that my path of hunting has taken me. It's just. I want to shoot my own animal, and I want someone else to shoot their own animal. I, I just, I mean, like we were back there, Jace. You were filming me deer hunting, and if a flock of deer would have came out, I, and Jason was with me, and Kyle was with me, I could have shot three deer. <laughs> but I wouldn't right. have. Yeah. But I could have. Was was the culture kind of like opposite of your thinking, to where it was like, I don't care if I shoot a deer, I want to see group success and I want to take home some of this meat or what was the thought back then? I, I think it was because it was so meat centric yeah, and so focused on sharing. Like my dad, if he shot a deer, Mac and Bev got some of it. Vance and Ethel got some of it. Pat and Larry got some of it. it, it and so it, I don't think anyone really thought about it in a different context because a couple of things, no one ever traveled to hunt. My dad never hunted outside of Kuchichin County. <laughs> right. Well, you you create your own little micro cosm, your little group of what is okay and not okay. I think. Yeah. It's just like, and we do it everywhere. I mean, it's a little different now with media, which just, we'll get into later. But right. yeah. I, I mean, if guys from say Western New York or Vermont with their really you know well trained dogs and the culture around rough grouse hunting up there, which is a really fabulous culture, and they have grouse camps and everything else, if they came back to where I grew up in northern Minnesota and Jay saw it, I mean, there you can shoot small game from or across a county road, <laughs> right. So you can stand in the middle of the county road with the rough grouse in the birch trees and just kaboom, kaboom, kaboom until you got your limit. You can. It's legal. 
Oh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think there's some states where you can hunt, like, the ditches along mm-hmm. the roads, too. Like, you can uh-huh. just hunt pheasants and yeah. game birds in the ditches, so. And yeah. then, like, oh. private property on the other side. Oh, yeah, that. like, it's, it's ditch. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So. Yeah. I wonder if you so, can do that in the Dakotas. Cause I feel I'm, 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 I I'm, wanted to say South Dakota, but I'm not 100 yeah, percent positive. I'm, but I'm pretty. I think it is. South I'm Dakota. not either, but I know a lot of people that just drive yeah. for pheasant hunting. Yeah. Like they don't do a physical walking drive; they drive the roads <laughs> and wait until they, they call them like ditch chickens, right? Oh, you know? for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we so, we don't just see this in in hunting. We see it in all aspects of how we interact with nature. Oh yeah, whether it's fishing. Whether it's motorized travel, I mean, all it's very cultural, and I think it goes back to what you said, Marcus, about who was your mentor in all this. Yeah, and that's what. So I was going to ask Blake and Jace as well, but like, so who, like, who was your mentor? How do you think? What formed your hunting culture or your your belief belief system that you follow today? Do you think like how was yeah. that? So I definitely would say it was my dad because he was the one that like introduced me to the outdoors Mm -hmm. and it was like me and him hunting pretty much until I was able to drive and then you kind of venture out and meet some other friends and you go to school and you meet your college buddies and I think it would be a mix between my dad and then furthering that when I went into college and just kind of forming our own opinions on how we wanted to chase turkeys or how we wanted to hunt geese Um, so that would be my answer yeah Jace what do you think yeah so I mean my dad is the one who first introduced me into hunting and but that was very briefly when I was quite young, and I kind of took a hiatus from hunting for a while. It wasn't until in college I kind of really got back into it. And from there, I was kind of almost on my own without a direct mentor because I wasn't hunting with my dad. Um, so I think media had a big influence of what I was seeing in the hunting world and then hunting with buddies in college. And I think from there, I was seeing all these different worlds of hunting culture. I was noticing different trends and depending on where I was watching or who I was going hunting with. And then from there, I kind of was like definitely gravitated towards some things and didn't like others. So I, I I don't know, like between media and friends and other avenues, I was kind of seeing a bunch of different cultures and like kind of just picking what I, Felt right to me, if that makes sense. Gotcha. I just noticed this now that the we swung the, the camera arm into like a camera shot. So I don't know if we can. Oh, I did this. <laughs> yeah, if you pivot that. Either you pivot your your boom your mic. It's just the mic. mic. Just it's move not the a big deal. Yeah. It's just gonna be part. It'll be covering part of me for. I think I'm good. Okay. How, how does it <laughs> My, sound? A little a little high is there. But yeah, I was, I was gonna say so. I, even though my dad was, you know, kind of my mentor going into hunting. Like, I started reading magazines, like I think Eastman's Hunting Journal and stuff like that. I feel like that also started to influence, like, what I viewed as a normal scenario. So, like, reading these stories in Eastman's, and that's just the main thing that comes to mind of, like, what we had. And so I feel like that was the beginning of what maybe changed some of my, you know, upbringing from my parents and my friends which was largely what it started with. But then now it's grown into so much more with social media and YouTube. And like, I mean, we're on YouTube right now. Like, the, right. and it's just like, so I, and to think of like new hunters who don't have that mentor, like how are they developing like what they view as a normal hunting culture? Like what's good, what's bad, right. what's ethical, what's unethical. And so I, I feel like media whether it's written or, you know, visual media is like probably influencing a lot of new hunters. Cause it did for me too. Like, even though I had those mentors growing up and friends that we, you know, kind of have our own little micro group of, of what we view as okay. Then you start seeing different stuff. And so, and yeah. depending on which media you're consuming, it's like drastically different. Yeah. Like if you're watching, you know, some like whatever, us or meat eater or like some long range hunting show or the duck commander. That was a huge thing. Like there's Mm -hmm. all these different funnels that are like, you know, people are seen as like their first experience of something related to hunting. And it's just, I don't know. It's it's like fascinating to think about like what cultures are being created right now or shifted or changed of like what's normal, what's good, what's okay. Yeah. It's, I don't know, super interesting to me. 
Yeah, I, I would say the biggest influence on me of changing my perspectives on a lot of things. Because when you grow up, and that's what, if you hunt the same area with the same people, you are indoctrinated, if you want to call it that, or you're at least very tied to whatever that social norm is there. And that's mm -hmm. how I was. When I moved out west, uh, I lucked out and I got uh, to work with a guy who wrote a book called Beyond Fair Chase, Jim Posowitz. And it became the little pocket guide for everybody who went to hunter education. And it became, it, it's as the title describes, thinking beyond just the chase and what's, you know. A, beyond what's legal. Right. Like, like what is right. fair right. chase? Yeah. And so I read and read and read and, you know, you had a chance to film Jim when we did some of our interviews and stuff. And I would say that is what most heavily influenced me and probably reading sports of field, outdoor life, field and stream, reading those stories and how people hunted in other places. It, it started expanding my mind. And I think it also was part of why I said, I'm moving out West. Mm-hmm. And as quick as I could get here, I, I came. Uh, so you you roll that forward to today. Like you said, what's one of the most popular forms of media that gets consumed? Video, social media. You're probably right, Marcus. Whether we realize it or not, we are, for new hunters, whether they're adult or younger, we're probably establishing some of their norms of what they accept or what they're right. going to develop. And I think there's still a pretty decently sized group of people that are largely not influenced by, by the hunt, by hunting media. You know, mm -hmm. there, oh, yeah. I still know plenty of people who don't have any social media yeah. accounts. They don't watch YouTube and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I like, I'm not discounting that. I think that there still very much is mm -hmm. that those like little micro groups of people in different places, but yeah. And that can be good or bad too. Like, and again, but what is good or bad? <laughs> like if it, if it falls within the bounds of legality, then it's like we have these whole definitions. And I think I used to be a lot more judgmental of like certain people's like actions or whatever. Like, like I, I guess one example that comes to mind is like, I, I would grew up like jump shooting ducks mm -hmm. and I had no idea that it was like, like the, there's a lot of people who frown upon that. Oh, yeah. Like there's like there's like that. Like why why would you do that? You're just ruining it for, yeah. you know, the guys who are decoy hunting. And I was like, I, I don't know. I didn't even think about it. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. That it's not. And I still love jump shooting ducks. But it's like trying to like see the other people's point of view and like see where they're coming from. And like before I jump to too many conclusions of like what is right, yeah. what is wrong, I, and it's just like. I, I don't know. It, it, it's heavily dependent on the species also. Jace, yeah. you guys have a ton of wild hogs in California. And it's like, just kill them. There, there's not a whole lot of rights and wrongs about something like a hog. I don't know why. Right, yeah. Like, you could go aerial gun hogs, and that, and people are like, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Let's maybe, shoot, them, shoot them all. Maybe. But then if you, like, I guarantee there's people who don't like that. Mm -hmm. And if you started doing that with other species, then they really, really wouldn't like that. Yeah. So it's like, it's, I don't know. Uh, I mean, look at electronic calls. Mm -hmm. Some places you can use electronic calls. Can I don't know. Can you use electronic calls for turkeys anywhere? I don't think so. But I know, like, in for a snow geese, it's pretty... Really? Pretty common, especially in the spring migration season. Okay. It's, it's very common. Or you can't use electronic calls for elk, but you can use them here in Montana for predators. predators. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's so interesting when you think about it's not just regional. It's by species. It's by all oh, yeah. kinds of stuff. And uh, no, I, I, I like I, digging into it. it it fascinates me. Yeah, I find it fascinating to just, like, try to understand why people have the thought process that they do before I try to, you know, jump to conclusions and either bash them or, or whatever. Just, to, like, try to understand it. But then also, like, for my own, like, what do I want my hunting culture to be that I perpetuate either through media or through my friends or family? Mm -hmm. And it's just, like, I guess I just ask myself, like, what's my goal? You know, and, like, just want to have amazing habitats and 
a lot of wildlife on those habitats. And it's like, okay, it, am, is what I'm doing jeopardizing that goal? Is it, is it good for that goal? Is it bad for that goal? And so I guess that's just like kind of how I think about it for my own personal culture of what I'm, I'm putting out there. But outside of that, I don't know. It's just like, it's really interesting. I think uh, there's, and there's some of these things that this, that's fine if people want to do, you know, uh, whatever, like the turkey hunting one is like the one that always pops into my mind. Like there's a lot of different thought processes of how to kill a turkey, whether it's like decoying, not decoying, only using a mouth call, uh, you know, not not moving around, not like don't really? spot and stalk. Like spot and stalking a turkey is like a big no-no in a lot of places, highly frowned upon. Um it, it it all depends, right? Oh, yeah. the reaping of turkeys. That's oh man, one. that is the what? Like uh, if you take a turkey fan and you use that to like sneak up or basically you like walk through a field with a turkey fan and like you know to pretend you're a turkey to get yeah. close to him to kill him. Like that is a very divisive. Like, yeah. like people get super fired up about that, and like part of it's safety because like right. obviously if you're see, pretending to be a, a turkey, like there's a good chance you're gonna get shot. Yeah. But so there's that whole aspect of it. But then you'll see people that oh, I was on my own ranch, like no one else has permission, and like it doesn't matter. And it, people just get super fired up about yeah. turkey reaping. And I'm like, I, I mean, it's like a, I I don't know. I haven't done it, so I don't really know. Like, it's, it's a situational thing. I guess I feel like you had your own private property and it's safe. But then some people just think it's like totally unethical too. Like that's not okay because. <laughs> <laughs> it, for whatever makes it reason what too easy or something i think so <laughs> yeah that, i think that's part of like the argument part, it makes it too easy or but yeah the safety thing I, like that i get like right. the, the whole safety thing like that makes sense if you're like on public land and you're running around with a turkey fan not a good idea yeah. but like i think that goes back to your statements about like the influence of media on new hunters oh yeah because like reaping a turkey looks like a lot of fun i mean you've got a bird that's coming in hot and heavy and like it's getting ready to attack you and oh, yeah, it's five like feet away and five feet away from oh yeah it looks insane yeah but yeah there's a huge safety aspect um and kind of what you mentioned jace where it like is too easy uh it's it's clicking into like a fixed action pattern which is like a behavior that turkeys have they're like from the moment they're born they're establishing their pecking order and then all of a sudden there's this big tom that comes in the, the reaper is mm. this big tom that comes in and tries to take over their territory and isn't in this pecking order so it's it's in their innate behavior to be like i'm gonna fight that thing mm -hmm. and they have no control over it and you'll see these videos of dudes like or girls walking out with these turkey decoys walking up to these birds and they're coming at them and they start attacking them and they'll drop that turkey decoy and that bird will still be attacking that decoy they're just so and fixed on yeah it. they don't just... care about what else is going on except maintaining yeah, it's like that packing order it's not pretty wild like, yeah it's, but that's like the one where like again i just haven't done it and so like yeah. It, but yeah there's like i see both sides of it Absolutely. but then like my big thing that i like to do i like spot and stock turkey like i grew up doing that and like there's yeah. a lot of people like that's not okay and like there's like you know the safety concerns of that in theory as well but it's just like gr i was growing up hunting western states turkeys like there's a lot of really open landscape, and I think some of the same safety concerns yeah. are a little different than if you were hunting back east. But yeah, absolutely. When um, when I was on TV, the production guidelines did not allow you to shoot an animal in its bed. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's an interesting one, that, yeah. That one where I stood there on that rock just a few feet above that elk in New Mexico for 20-some minutes. Troy, my camera guy, he's like, because I'm like, I'll just shoot him right here. He's like, no, he's got to stand up. Uh, it's, I, I have no idea where that came from. And, and I have tried to figure out since then where this, you can't shoot an animal in its bed. I mean, a bedded animal is probably the most alert animal. It's bedded somewhere where it's feeding that it, or, or that it's uh, smelling and, and watching. Right. Most bedded animals are very hard to sneak up on. Yeah, but. I also feel like that's kind of like the Western spot and stock, like tactic of choice is like you watch them in the morning and then they go to bed and then you make your move right. Is right. that mm -hmm. as someone who doesn't a do lot it a of, lot? But. And again, I, again, I don't know where that came from, but I think 
a big part of waiting for them to stand up for, in my mind is just to get a clean shot. Right. A lot of times, like if you sneak up on a mule deer or whatever in the sagebrush, like there's just no clean shot until he stands up. It's just right. vitals are obscured. Yeah, so that in that hunting. like aspect, it's like, okay, I've heard people say something about like the vitals are, are more open and like less, it, it presents a little bit bigger target. So mm-hmm. I don't know if that plays into like the F but I think it's this, I think there is a, a group of people who think it's just like, oh, it's not fair because it's like their safe place, essentially. Like, oh, they're they're yeah. bedded. They think they're safe. Like, that's un, it's not sporting. It's not fair chase to yeah. shoot them in their bed. Which, again, that's, that's that person's belief, I guess. I haven't met yeah. too many people with that one, though. But apparently it was big enough that it made production. It was in the production guide. guideline. Yeah. So that that is interesting because that's not something I ever heard. Yeah. Like, growing up, I never... Yeah, heard of either. any concerns of shooting a bedded animal but. i didn't either you know and then you get to other places like in northern minnesota deer drives are a big thing yeah and i would hear if you did a drive people would look at you like you lost your mind you know we're gonna oh. do a drive for elk up here <laughs> you know <laughs> i'd be like what the? <laughs> i've seen but. people do it I, maybe i grew up in a different oh, uh, really? a slightly okay. different culture i've seen people do some elk drive i mean it's usually like an island patch of timber Right, yeah. and then you go push the, that patch of timber, and okay, bullets start flying. Hmm. I haven't. I shouldn't say I haven't participated in that. I, I've never. <laughs> I've I've, yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> I've never yeah. successfully yeah. like been and, a part of one of those. And but. then there are some <laughs> states you can't quarter your deer up. You got to bring it out. Yep. Home. Pennsylvania, you got to bring a a bear out whole, and they're shooting five and six hundred pound bears there. How in the hell are you getting a five? You better be able to drive up to that. (laughs) Yeah, I'm kidding. (laughs) Yeah. So again, there's just so many of these things that are there, and I'm I I I like having them all there because it's reflective of how diverse our our hunting culture is. Yeah. And I, wherever I go, I'm going to try to stay in the norms of, of what's expected, right? I, uh, if someone invites me, like last year I got invited to Mississippi by my buddy Alex Harvey, and it's not like I'm going to go down there and say, well, this is how we do it in Montana. I'm there to learn and absorb mm-hmm. what are the cultures and, and the expectations and the norms of Mississippi. I thought it was cool. And uh, so... Yeah, I don't think there's a right or wrong with any of it, and I'm I'm glad you brought it up, Marcus. That you you're now way less quick to judge than you used to be, and I'm the same way. I I used to think that my way that I was taught that's the way, right? And now I'm just fascinated, and I'm like, I wonder where that comes from. Yeah, but and I think it's going to change over time. I think, especially like I bring up the wolf thing one more time when people see that that the masses are going, that is not okay. And right. so I think there's going to be more things like that in the future that we might view as acceptable right now. Yeah. But when the masses see it or whoever, you know, it's like all of a sudden it's going to shift and be like, no, that is not okay. Yeah. And I, so like accepting that, like, well, we might like, I want to be accepting of a lot of different cultures, a lot of different ideas, but I right. think just knowing how society works, like cultural culture shift and they're gonna, there's going to be things that are, not okay in the future just for whatever reason and i think some of it's just like if it doesn't affect our ability to actually go hunting it's going to be like a case-by-case basis right like there's some things that like the anti-hunting crowd would want to just absolutely you know use it to stop hunting altogether Mm -hmm. but then there's other things that we're probably going to have to you know make regulations around or shift hunting cultures to yeah. To adapt, you know, adapt with the times, whether we like it or not. It's, I think that's, we're going to see that. Yeah, and I, I think the one you brought up of the Wyoming where it's legal to run them down with snowmobiles. When I heard that was legal, I'm like, you got to be shitting me. I, I and did, Would any of you have thought that was legal? No, not at all. I, I, I knew it was legal because I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, I, that's why I knew it was also because someone told me that it was. And I'm like, What? Does that apply to, like, ATVs, UTVs? I don't know. That you, I, I believe sure. so. But I think there, I mean, like, if you were on public land and if you're driving off-road, depending on the, what land you're yeah. on, then that would be the illegal part of it. And okay. depending on what law enforcement agent, they, you know, could probably use their discretion to, yeah. Yeah. to you know, ticket you or whatever. But if you're on private property, yeah, probably. You could do whatever. Yeah. So I, 
I think there will be changes, and I think there's some things that the majority of people would be like, yeah, <laughs> that probably needs to be changed. But, yeah. you know, and then there's going to be some people are like, look, that's what we've done forever, and we're not changing. So yeah. I think it's really cool. <laughs> I, and so I guess my lesson that I, I leave from this that maybe is the lesson I've learned in all my years of hunting and, and trying to immerse myself in other cultures is – Look at it for what it is and try to understand it. Don't try to overlay your value system on top of whatever that is. Yeah. So. Good good words to end on. Well, thanks, guys, for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Cool stuff.